Well, we've been talking about the kingdom of God um, and how Jesus gave us a lot of different uh, metaphors for the kingdom of God, and one of those is a party. And that's why we've got balloons for four weeks, all right? You need to remember that he invites us into a, a feast, a, a banquet, a party, and everybody's invited. Nobody's left out, he says. Uh, that first scripture that we had where he talked about going out into the highways and the byways and inviting everybody to come in. And we remember today that there's nothing that we can do that will stop his invitation to us because he wants everybody to come to the party. And not only is everybody invited, but last week what we talked about is how Every one of us is also charged with being an inviter. He, it's like he gives us the invitation. He says, do you have any friends? Do you have anybody that you would like to invite to the party? And we go, wow, I've got all kinds of friends. And he said, well, until they uh, have faith for themselves, would you have faith for them? And, and here's this invitation. And this week we're going in a little bit deeper. And look at the personal invitations that Jesus gave to his close followers and what that meant. And and today I, I want to go through uh, just one time when Jesus invited his first disciples. It's found in John 1. If you like to look along in the Bible, uh, those Bibles that are on the floor, it's on page 809. It's in the Gospel of John. And we're going to just break this down for a little bit. John 1, 35, beginning with John 1, 35. We'll go, go all the way to 51, but we're going to do it in pieces. So the next day John was standing again with his two disciples. And when he saw Jesus walking along, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he asked, What are you looking for? Well, this, this is, sometimes there's too many Johns in Scripture. I mean, there just are. There's just a lot of Johns. This John that we start off with isn't the writer of the gospel the, the writer of the gospel is probably this unnamed guy that's one of the two that see Jesus. But this John is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, as he's called, his whole purpose in life is to be a setup man for Jesus. I mean, that's all that he is, but he's a good one. He's the last of the prophets, and he comes and he baptizes for the repentance of the sins. He says, you know, get your life cleaned up because one's coming, the Messiah's coming, and, and he didn't hang around with a lot of other people. He's, we'd, we'd think he was a little strange. Uh, he hung around kind of out in the desert, down there by Jericho, uh, Sea of Galilee, or not, excuse me, not Sea of Galilee, but the Dead Sea and the Jordan River, and people were coming out to be baptized by him. And I love the way that John the Baptist sees Jesus walking by and just kind of matter of factly goes, oh, Lamb of God, you know. And it's like, what a strange thing, comment that is to us, you know, the Lamb of God as Jesus goes by. And yet, what he's making reference to, of course, is the old temple worship that they would do is they would, you know, sacrifice a lamb to shed blood for their sins. And then also more than that, looking into the Passover observance, where each Passover, they would remember that time when they were down in Egypt, and, and you, you know that story, or you've seen the movie, where, you know, all the plagues and all that stuff, and gets down to the last plague, and they, they kill that one lamb and put the blood on their, on their doorposts, so the angel of death does not come in. And even, even here early on, you know, just the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, um, we see that the purpose of Jesus is the atonement. The purpose of Jesus is shedding his blood, a uh, sacrifice on the cross, and John makes reference to that. And then it says that the two disciples of John the Baptist uh, see Jesus, and they hear what John says about him, and they just leave John. And they go, well, okay, there goes the Lamb of God. We'll go follow him. And when Jesus saw them following, he says, what are you looking for? It's, it's a loaded question. Let's go on. They said, Rabbi, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? And he replied, come and see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Two men want to know where Jesus is staying, but there's, there's more here than that. They're, they're really asking permission to come closer. 
You see, they've been discipled by John. Now they're moving over to Jesus. And Jesus gives this wonderful phrase, and if there's anything that you take home today, I want you to take this phrase home with you. Come and see. He says, come and see. Now there's the invitation. There's, there's the personal invitation by God to, to come and see. Come closer. Get into a relationship with me, he says. Uh, hang out with me for a while. Jesus says. And if you're seeking, just, okay, guys, just come check it out. You want to know what it is. Jesus um, allows us to think that we found him. I mean, most of us have said, I found God. Uh, you, you know, you really didn't find God. Um, Bernardo Clairvaux said, uh, thou ownest the field in which I found thee. You know, um, he allows us to think that, but all the circumstances in life, it's all Holy Spirit orchestrated that moves us to, to some people and, and we hear some things and, you know, God allows himself to be found, but really he's finding us all the time. And he doesn't demand faith. This isn't a challenge to him. He says, well, he doesn't say, well, I'll interview you and see if you're worthy to be my disciples. He doesn't say, could you, could you give me an, an, a resume or what theological camp are you in? Are you liberal? Are you conservative? Or, you know, you, you baptism uh, under or sprinkle or, or uh, you know, you, you, you drink a one cup or you pass out the, the shot glasses and the chiclets? He doesn't ask any of that stuff, right? He just says, come and see. There are many different times in our lives, I think, where God invites us to come closer and we don't even recognize it. I mean, we miss it. I think he's always asking us to come closer. But uh, Jesus invites us, as we are, to come closer, to listen, to observe, to, uh, as the psalmist said, to taste and see that the Lord is good. And he doesn't trap us. He doesn't coerce us. He doesn't threaten us. He's just always inviting us. God respects who we are. And he gently invites us to come in and, as we would say, hang with him. Um, the church we were at in Illinois before we moved back to Kentucky, we did Alpha. Some of you are familiar with the Alpha program. Remember we did Alpha here when we first started out? Some of you were in that. And the Alpha program came over from England, and it's kind of like this whole thing of come and see. As a matter of fact, uh, we put on the, the church was on a major thoroughfare and had a big sign out front, and we put on the sign, questions about God, come and see, Alpha. And we had people that actually walked in to Alpha the first night because they just wanted to see what was going on. They had questions about God. Great program. Um, we had one couple that, um, it was, it was a young, uh, couple. They weren't married yet. They were interracial and I think they felt like they didn't fit some places, but a friend of theirs was doing, uh, the dinner that night and he said, why don't you come and see about Alpha? And so they showed up and they had not really been to church before, but they, you know, they enjoyed it and Alpha was real low key and we had dinner together and then we sat and talked in little groups for a while and they kind of liked it so they came back the next night and the next night and about the fourth night I gave them a Bible and they went home and it was one of those Bibles that had questions and answers in it and they went through those things and they were, you know, kind of digesting and digging. They never read the Bible before and by the time we got to about the eighth or the ninth week of Alpha, they came up to me and they said, Pastor, we're thinking about getting married. Would you marry us? I said, wow, would I be honored to marry? And there's a whole another um, story about the, the miracles that went around their, their wedding and the healing of relationships that happened through that. But they just kind of got this come and see. Let's just hang out at this church with these Christians for a while. <laughs> And, we, you know, we didn't examine them. We didn't see what their theology was or anything. We just loved on them. They're still back in that church. Uh, they're leaders in that church, married with two children. And that's been about seven or eight years now that that's happened. But what a fantastic story. You know, we could tell uh, other stories. Pastors could tell other stories of people that just kind of come and, and hang for a while. But that, that's the way that Jesus does it. Okay, let's move on. Verse 40, one of the two disciples who heard what John said and followed Jesus was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. Um, 
he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. He led him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You're Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. One of the men is Andrew. Every time that John mentions Andrew in, in the book, three different times Andrew is mentioned, each time Andrew is bringing someone to Jesus. He's just one of these connection guys that just is always bringing somebody to Jesus. And uh, we talked about that last week, you know, about the six degrees of separation and how God puts you around certain people to connect you to him. And Andrew gets his brother uh, Simon and Jesus just gives him a new name. Jesus looks at him and in essence says, you know, I see more in your future than a guy that's named Simon, which means God has heard. He says, you're now Peter, which we know means rock. And this was when the WWF was formed, was <laughs> right here. It was Jesus doing that. No, that, that's the guy who became, he became, he became this rock that the whole church just leans on because he's so strong, you know. And Andrew is immediately overshadowed by his brother Peter. Now think about that. Andrew brings Peter and Peter becomes the rock. And, you know, Andrew doesn't say, well, who am I? But, but he just, that's okay, okay, because it's Jesus. And uh, now let's go on. Verse 43. It says, the next day Jesus wanted to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets, Jesus, Joseph's son from Nazareth. And Nathan, Nathanael responded, can anything from Nazareth be good? Now, excuse me, I, you know, I kind of think of that. We'd say, well, we've got a new pastor. He's from Louisville. And we'd go, hmm. Oh, let's, let's go deeper. Uh, he's, he's from Knoxville. We go, I don't know. That's, that's not going to work, I don't think. Knoxville, does he wear the orange, you know? And that's kind of his attitude. But Philip says, come and see. See, more are invited to the kingdom, more invited to the party. And first, Philip is invited by Jesus, and then he runs home and tells Nathanael, and he says, we found the Messiah, the one promised to us what Moses and the prophets said, and he's from Nazareth. And Nathanael, he knows his Bible, he knows his OT, and he says, oh, wait, now the Messiah is not supposed to come from Nazareth, and the spy is supposed to come from Bethlehem, right? So he says, I don't know. And Philip doesn't argue with him. He just says the same thing to him that Jesus said to him. He says, come and see. So he doesn't need to explain everything to him. He says, if you come and you hang out, you see this guy, you'll know who he is. You see. See the pattern? The same phrase, same attitudes used by Jesus is then used by Philip. He didn't, he didn't need to answer Nathaniel's questions or objections. He, he knew that once he met Jesus, his objections would fall away. Let's go on. Verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, Here is a genuine Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are God's son. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. I assure you that you will see heaven open and God's angels going up to heaven and down to earth on the human one. Now, there's a lot more there than what we're going to preach today. But I love this progression. I love this progression of Jesus' attitude, come and see. And then immediately, you know, Philip has the same thing, come and see. There's, there's a thread there. And like last week when we were talking about the six degrees of separation and how God places us in the lives of others for our growth and for our development, I think that we see that here. Now, as, as we look at this story and we say, well, what's that got to do with, with me today? All right, come and see. The first thing that strikes me is that questions are okay. Questions are even cool. I mean, we, we may not encourage that sometimes in the, in, in the church. We're not, we're not invited because we have answers. Uh, we answer the invitation of God because we don't have answers. Did you ever think about that? You, you're, you're not 
a follower of Christ because you know all the answers. You're a follower of Christ because you don't have all the answers. We're seekers. And God says, come and see. When I was a little boy, um, you know, this kind of thing gets you thrown out of church. You, you could always ask what. What happened, but you could never ask why. Because, you know, good little boys don't ask questions like that. The, the Sunday school teacher may not know why, and you might embarrass a Sunday school teacher. That was the bottom line. They didn't say that, but it's just irreverent to ask why of God. In fact, still today, there are many who simply won't tolerate any questions and don't, especially questions that don't match their answers. Um, I have um, literally thrown study guides in the trash because when I started reading the questions, the questions were aimed at giving the answers that the author had in his pocket or her. And I just, you know, can't we do any better than this? Can't we use questions that really, you know, drive us to God instead of just kind of regurgitating someone's <laughs> doctrine back at us? I was uh, brought up in the faith by a man who had a, a big black Bible like mine, same black Bible. And the reason that he had it, he said, is because you can write in the margins. And I didn't know what that meant for a while. And now my margins are almost full in my Bible. But he would have question marks. And he was a mature, learned Christian. And he had question marks. And I've got, still got question marks, a lot of question marks in my Bible. As I say, it's not the things that I don't understand that bothers me. It's the things that I do understand that bother me. Right? And every once in a while, uh, somebody will shed some light on something, and, and I'll get to erase a question mark. But there's nothing wrong with having questions. It, it keeps us humble before God. I think today, uh, maybe like in every day, we're plagued by those whose theology confines and defines God for them, what God can do. Don't come with questions to the Almighty, but they come with their answers and how they see the world and they decide what in the Bible can be true and what can't be true based on their own theology and based on their assumptions that they've made. And we say, oh, those, those liberals. No, it's the conservatives too. We, we have both camps that have everything all figured out about everything. And I'm not talking about just some basics. I mean, they, they take big chunks out of the Bible and go, well, that doesn't apply to us and this doesn't apply to us. It's because they can't ask questions. You know what I mean? And if we place them, I think, in this scene of Jesus and these initial disciples, and Jesus walked by them, I say, well, there he goes, mister. I think I'm God, and I know everything, but we know he's not God because uh, he believes in the resurrection of the body. That's what the Sadducees would have said, and so he can't be God. And the Pharisees would have said, well, he eats with sinners, so he can't be God, because they had it all figured out. They, they couldn't come close enough to Jesus to really listen to him. And he was with his life saying, come and see. And they said, eh, you, you know, you've got uh, three out of the ten wrong on our checklist, so... Uh, no, I, th I think that you must not be right for us. So they never got close enough to him. See, some people think that what they believe forms reality. Now listen to me here. What they think, Charles Stanley, what they think, what they believe forms reality. What we believe does not form reality. Reality is what exists when we stop believing. God is the one that decides what reality is. We don't get the choice to decide what reality is based on what we believe. You hear people say, well, I just don't believe that. And they think that that makes it go away. It doesn't make it go away. Not if God has said it and it's true, see? Questions are always welcome. Reality is not decided by us. I think of those who brought questions to Jesus. I think of Nicodemus at night. He had questions. I think of the rich young ruler. He had questions. He had some blockages, but he had some questions. There were others that brought questions. They weren't seekers. They were protecting themselves and their checklist. They didn't receive the invitation. They left it in the junk mail stack, so to speak. It was those without, quest without questions whom he uninvited. He eventually uninvited the Pharisees. They really uninvited themselves. Pharisees thought they knew it all. You know, you can't teach 
somebody something that they think they know everything. So they never came to the party. Well, today our questions, I think, are a little bit different in our environment. We're, we're not going through the checklist to see if the Messiah fits all the signs that we have seen. Our questions that we wrestle with are probably a little bit different today as the seekers come to the church for the first time. Uh, things like, how can a loving God allow so much suffering in the world? It's a rough one, isn't it? Questions like, is Jesus really God? How can he be God and son of the God at the same time? I mean, that just sounds like that's a contradiction there. How can the Bible be true when there's so many just really strange, weird things in it? You know, I, real questions. Uh, why is the Bible more reliable than other books of other religions? Uh, is Christianity true? Then oh, th this really gets into us. If Christianity, if Christianity is really true, then, then why are Christians just sometimes just so weird, okay, and judgmental? And we are not any different than the rest of the world, <laughs> but just we're held to a higher standard. I still believe that God says, come and see, come closer. Uh, let's live around you for a while. In our day and age, uh, most people really just want to argue. They really don't have questions. I've never known of anybody being argued into faith. It just doesn't happen. But rather, a seeker comes close and in time then finds the faith in Christ. Back in 2009, Pew Research Forum uh, ran a study um, to explore the complexity of faith in the modern world and overlap between religions and other supernatural beliefs. I probably said that too quickly for you. Uh, the survey explored the complexity of faith in the modern world and the overlap between religions and other supernatural beliefs. And what they found was that 65% showed evidence of adhering to contradictory religious beliefs. Uh, in addition to believing the message of the Bible, uh, they believed in reincarnation, astrology, seances, ghosts, psychics, the power of evil eye, yoga as a religion. And Pew Research Forum isn't exactly a conservative forum. And they said, it's strange in our day that we hold contradictory beliefs at the same time. They concluded that a lot of that was because of the way that we gather information today, which is mainly on the Internet. And we have this grab bag where the first thing we do is we Google something and we get some sites and we take some from there and some from there and some from there. But we don't really ask questions of anybody. And that's why Jesus says, come and see. Today he's not physically here, but he's here in the body. And we are a part of the body. We might be a, just a little hair follicle on the whole body as the gathering, but we are part of the body. So come and see. I just think of a couple things. The first one is community. The disciples lived with Jesus for three years. Uh, there's no way to quickly uh, have transformation. It takes time. You can't hurry up. Uh, getting the truth from, from God. Um, Mike Iaconelli wrote, wrote a quote, I think I put it in the bulletin, that is, um, if you hear just part of it, it's enough. He says, spirituality is not a formula. It's not a test. It's a relationship. Spirituality is not about competency. It's about intimacy. Boy, take that home with you. Spirituality is not about perfection. It's about connection. The way of the spiritual life begins when we are now in the mess of our lives. Accepting the reality of our broken, flawed lives is the beginning of spirituality, not because the spiritual life will remove our flaws, hear that, but because we let go of seeking perfection and instead seek God. Oh, you ought to underline that. That's good. That'd make your refrigerator. The one who is present in the tangledness of our lives. Mike liked to make up words too. Spirituality is not about being fixed, it's about God's being present in the mess of our unfixedness. See? So Jesus is still inviting us into community. Uh, he's physically here uh, in the body. Uh, we are the body. That means that we just need to let other people in. You got to spend time with other people. Sometimes I think just hanging with people, not just at church, but just being in relationship with other people is more important than what we do here. It really is. 
just, you know, we, we kind of get it by osmosis, by, by being around another person that's walking with Christ. Think about Jesus, how much that he was around them. I always say that he had to listen to Peter snore every night. That's how close they were. You had to listen to that happen. It takes time. It means we share our lives. Some of you, no doubt, have been on mission trips. I know Marcus is getting ready to go on one to Haiti again. Yep. Going to Haiti in October. Been on mission trips. Um, some of you uh, also remember Brian. Not many in the room. A uh, couple that remember Brian Stakeland from Versailles. He was my associate for... Uh, 50 or 60 years, it seemed like. No, Brian was a wonderful guy, just a crazy, nutty guy. But we were on mission trip, and what happens on mission trip is that you have like this crash course in community because you take people out of their homes and their comfort zones, and you put them together to bunk together, and they sleep on the floor together, and they, they work together, and they eat together, and, and you just really you know get to know who a person is. And, and I remember going with Brian for the first time on mission trip, and man, did I learn who he was. He pranked me. <laughs> Brian pranked. I was his senior minister. I was, in essence, kind of the closest thing to he had to a boss. He pranked me on mission trip. I got up and got ready to shave, and there was no razor in my razor. I thought, wow. Because I left that at home. I don't know, man. You know, I was like 40 years old, and I thought I was so old. And the next day, he was back. And I said, ah, Brian, you know. And he just, I just had this whole new appreciation for who he was. Great, great guy. Great, great, you know, great Christian man. But, but you got to spend some time with people. You know, you got to be around them. And, and Jesus says to us, you know, you, you want to you wanna give an invitation to somebody, then let them come and see. Let them in your life. You know, hang with them for a while. Do some things with them. The next uh, thing I, I think of is explore Scripture together. And this is also done in community. Um, we need to be, I think, always at a place where we are digging into the Word, where we are studying the Word in the context of other people because they have part of the, the pieces too. It's not just us. See, but in and, and a, and a place where we can ask questions. Uh, nothing thrills me more than to be teaching a Bible study class. And we have one lady right now that says all the time, I love coming to this class because you can ask any question. I said, that's right. You don't get the answers, but you can ask the questions, right? But, but that's an important part of, of Jesus saying, come and see. Then the last thing I think of here is that we should seek God, seek Seek Jesus, not just seek happiness. I think most of us come to the church initially because something's kind of messed up in our life. Something's happened. And so we think maybe God has some answers. And, you know, th the answer is in the person. The answer is not in having the happiness. If we uh, come and see long enough, we find the church is not about really about answers. Church just says people who are walking with Jesus. And, and that, in essence, is kind of the answer. We find that he's, he's more than an answer to our problems. We seek happiness. We seldom find it. But when we seek Jesus, we become happy even when the problems get worse. End of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, uh, Jesus gives us kind of a crash course of an antidote to stress and anxiety. He says, don't worry about those things. Remember that, that part? He says, you know, you're worried about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear and what you're going to wear to the party, Right. And uh, he says, don't worry about that stuff. He says, life doesn't consist of that. And then he gives us this Matthew 6, 33. And uh, he says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So he says, seek him. Boy, if we could just get that. That's so simple, and yet it's so huge. It's not about seeking happiness. It's about seeking God. And when we find God... We find the happiness. Well, you know, it's, it's a wonderful surprise. So, seek him. I don't know, may, maybe you've hung around church and you've never heard this. Strange how the church uh, does a lot of other things except get to Jesus, 
right? We've got all kinds of doctrine and theology and stuff to pass out, and this is what we believe here and there. But behind it all, there's this person who says, come and see. Now, here's your question. Here's your take-home question for the day. What is the invitation from Jesus to you today? If he's inviting you to come closer, then what does that look like in your life? What does it look like in your life if he's really inviting you in to, to know him? Then how does that take the form of some kind of action? I, I can't answer that for you. I'm just going to pray that the Holy Spirit does that as we, as we sit in prayer for a minute. As deep cries out 